question today is, have you ever felt hungry before? How does your body know that you're hungry? And why does it get hungry? What do we do with our energy? Why do we need to eat energy? All of these questions are things that we're gonna start focusing on today because they relate back to a major question of why we eat food. And we eat food to give our bodies energy and we need energy to run our body cells. So that's where we're gonna to start today. We're gonna to take a tour back to seventh grade biology in a cell model that I made with my pool. And we're gonna talk about what cells need to be happy, healthy, hydrated, wonderful cells. And then we're gonna talk a bit about the hormonal and nervous system inputs to digestion, feeling hunger, fullness, appetite, all of those things today. Our body needs energy because we need to fuel our body's cells. Here's a model of a cell. So in this cell, you can see that the cellular membrane or the phospholipid bilayer is represented by these pool flags. And then within the cell, we have various organelles. We have to start with, of course, the nucleus. There it is. And right next to it is the endoplasmic reticulum. You might remember that as that kind of accordion-like structure in the cell. Over here, we have a ribosome, very important for protein production. Then we have a Golgi body, a peroxisome, and then we have the mitochondria or the energy producer of the cell. So those are our cellular organelles. There are others, but I ran out of pool floats. And then the inside of the cell that looks like water, because it is, is the cytoplasm. So here's our basic unit of life, our cell. Every cell in our body contains a complete set of genes. And the genes that are active in that cell tell that cell which proteins to produce and that helps determine that cell's function. When you have an issue with a gene, you can get a disorder where certain proteins are not produced, maybe certain enzymes are not produced, and then you can have a nutrient a metabolism issue. One disease that's a good example of this is PKU, or phenylketonuria, where people who have this disease cannot break down the amino acid phenylalanine, so they cannot eat a lot of, they cannot eat foods that are really high in phenylalanine. So things, certain artificial sugars have a lot of phenylalanine and people with PKU want to stay away from foods that have those artificial sugars, which is why you'll sometimes see on diet sodas a warning that says, if you have PKU, don't eat this diet soda. Cells also have various lifespans. So some cells could last almost the entirety of your lifetime. Other cells are going to turn over and you're going to have to continuously replace them. So hair and nail cells are continuously replaced. Red blood cells only have a lifespan of four months, so we're always replacing those too. So a cell's lifetime will vary throughout your body. So all cells need energy, and they're getting energy through the food you eat in the form of macronutrients. So they're all gonna need your carbohydrates, your protein, your fat, and they're also going to need water. We all know that our hydrated cell is a happy cell. Now, the concentration of nutrients that are in a cell can tell the cell to produce certain proteins or do certain functions, so nutrient concentration can vary the activity of a cell. Cells also produce waste products, so they will produce CO2, carbon dioxide, and then their waste products will also be picked up and excreted from the cell. So how do cells get their nutrients? Well, they get them through the blood and the lymph systems, which I'm going to show you. So the blood system um, carries around their carbohydrate, their protein, a bunch of the micronutrients. And then the lymph system is going to bring cells fat and fat soluble vitamins because blood and fat don't really mix very well. Blood is a watery substance and fat does not like to be in water. It's called being hydrophobic. 
we'll talk much more about that. But so blood and blood and fat do not mix well. So blood so fat has its own transport system called lymph. So going around the cells, you have the circulatory system with blood, and then you have the lymph system, and the cells can then get the nutrients they need. The nutrients will go in the extracellular fluid, which is like all the concrete around our, on our, around our cell, and then they will be transported into the cell through various transport proteins and the cellular, cellular membrane into the cytoplasm or the intracellular fluid. So the cells are constantly picking up the various nutrients that they need and they're pretty smart because they'll take the nutrients they need and they won't take the nutrients that they don't need. And that's pretty cool actually. The groups of cells are tissues and then tissues can form organs and organs can then be grouped together into bodily systems. And so we want to talk about how some of those systems impact digestion and impact your cells. Okay, so cells are great, but how do they know when you're freaking starving? And what do they do about it? Well, they're getting messages from hormones and from your nervous system, and that's helping them to regulate your body's condition so that you stay pretty stable. So let's talk about hormones first. Hormones are basically the chemical messengers in your body. So they are released from glands like the pancreas, and then they signal other organs to do a certain thing to keep conditions stable. Okay, so how do the hormones insulin and glucagon help our body to maintain stable conditions? And in this case, the stable condition that they are helping us maintain is our blood sugar or our blood glucose level. So glucose is uh, the body's basically energy unit. So it's a form of carbohydrate. It is a simple sugar and it is the fuel that the body likes the best. So your body uses glucose as its like main energy source and therefore it's transporting glucose throughout your blood and you need your blood glucose level to stay within a narrow band to be healthy. You might have heard of blood glucose and insulin in relation to diabetes and people that have diabetes have an issue with the, either the insulin system or the insulin response. So they either don't have enough insulin or they're not responding well to insulin and that causes them to have issues regulating their blood glucose, which can be quite dangerous. For someone who doesn't have diabetes, when they eat a meal, so here's Kyle eating a giant piece of pizza from Coronet Pizza in, on the Upper West Side of New York City. So when Kyle eats that pizza, the pancreas is going to signal for the release of insulin. Insulin is the hormone that responds to a meal. And what insulin is doing, it is telling the, your muscle cells and your liver cells that they need to start sucking up glucose from the blood. So they need to start removing glucose from the blood and then you store it in your muscle cells and your liver cells. So that makes it possible for you to eat a huge slice of pizza and then to not just have out of control blood glucose because pizza has a lot of energy, a lot of glucose. And so if you ate a huge slice of pizza without insulin, you would have really high blood glucose. But insulin says, hey, 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 there's a lot of blood glucose here, muscle cells, liver cells, you're up. Please take this blood glucose out of the blood. So muscle cells and liver cells do that. Your blood glucose then drops. And so they've taken the glucose from the blood and it's caused your blood glucose to drop. After a few hours, you haven't eaten for a while, the pancreas is then going to respond to that condition. So once you haven't eaten, you're starting to get hungry, the pancreas is going to release some, another hormone, glucagon. And glucagon has the opposite effect of insulin. So it's responding to conditions of low blood glucose. So it's responding to when you haven't eaten for a while. And what glucagon is going to do is it's going to signal to the liver especially because the liver uh, is storing this blood glucose, the majority of it. Um, it's going to signal to the liver, please release your blood glucose and the blood glucose level is then going to rise. So it's gonna say liver, please release your glucose. Blood glucose then rises and that re results in stable blood sugar. 
So insulin and glucagon are kind of two sides of the same coin. They're active, both active in regulating blood glucose levels and they do, they have opposite effects. They're both hormones, they're both released by the pancreas, and so they're a really great example of hormonal messaging and how it's related to food and digestion and overall health. So in that example, you can really see how hormones help us to respond to a meal. They, they really are integral in how our body responds to eating food. Another function of hormones are that they can tell us our level of body fatness. So some hormones from fat cells are signaling to the brain like how many fat cells you have and how much body fatness you have. Isn't that really cool? Like you thought fat cells maybe just sit around and do nothing? No, they're actually metabolically active and they're sending out hormones and signaling to your brain. So that's pretty neat. Hormones also are integral in helping us regulate our appetite. There's a lot of hormones involved in this, but one example would be thyroid hormone. If you have a thyroid hormone disorder or a thyroid gland issue, you can sometimes have a really high appetite or really low appetite, and that's because of hormones influence on appetite. And then finally, hormones can help us to regulate our reaction to stress, so they can cause us to decrease our digestion or decrease our appetite. They could also increase our appetite in some types of stress, but they are integral in our stress response and how our appetite responds to that. Okay, so the hormonal system is super involved in signaling to our cells what's up in our bodies. But the other system that is also very important in communication throughout our body is our nervous system. So that's our brain and our nerves and our spinal cord, etc. And so what's happening is that our brain is getting messages from our digestive system. It could be hormonal messaging from the intestines and the stomach. It can also be just the stomach contraction, so the muscular stomach contraction. And these signals are going to a deep brain structure called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is integrating all these signals because it's in charge of monitoring conditions in our body. So it's in charge of figuring out if we're hydrated or if we have enough fuel, what nutrients we're missing. And then it signals to the cortex, which is like the thinking part of our brain. Hey, 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 really hungry in here. Can we please go eat something? So then you register that as consciously you're hungry, but you can also override those signals. You can say like, no, I'm actually not going to eat because it's not time or I'm in the middle of a meeting or I don't have any food so I can't eat. So our hypothalamus is integrating all these signals and, and collecting our hunger signals and then signaling to our cortex, but we can then consciously decide to ignore our physiological need for food or our hunger and pay no attention to it. We could also choose to ignore it in the opposite way where we eat when we're not actually hungry. So I just said something really important, which is that hunger is the physiological need for food. Appetite is the psychological need for food or a want for food. So, an app so you can be hungry, you need to have food physiologically, but have no appetite, you don't want to eat. Or you could be hungry and have a good appetite, so you're gonna go eat. Like right now, I would really like a snack, so I'm going to go eat as soon as I finish filming this. You can also have appetite and no hunger. This would be like having a full Thanksgiving meal and being like, oh my God, I'm so full, and then having room for dessert. So that's having no hunger, you just had a whole meal, but you want dessert, so that's appetite. And you can have no hunger and no appetite. Oftentimes when we're feeling sick, we might not really feel like we can even eat anything and we don't have an appetite. So. These are the different kind of relationships between hunger and appetite, but hunger is this physiological need for food that's signaled to our hypothalamus, and then our cortex can come in with our appetite and be like, nope, we're not gonna eat, or yes, we are. So the nervous system is so integral in, in really taking signals from our gut and then causing us to act on them consciously. gut is often called our second brain and there is a really strong connection between our brains and our guts 
If you've ever been nervous before, like you're psychologically nervous, but then you feel it in your stomach, that's the connection between your brain and your stomach. And just by thinking that you have a stomach issue, you can kind of cause yourself to have one. That's happened to me before. This happens to people when like they think they have a problem with gluten or milk or carbs or whatever. There's a certain nutrient there they think they don't do well with. You can cause your stomach to basically not do well with, with that nutrient by, by thinking that it's gonna ha be a problem. So that is a really powerful connection between our brains and our guts. And then it's so important to learn to honor and recognize your hunger signals so that you can develop a really healthy relationship with food where you're not getting freaking starving because you're eating before you get to that point. And so you're able to enjoy food and not eat too much to make you feel sick or not be eating enough to fuel your body. So we're gonna talk a lot more about honoring your hunger as the class goes on, but I just wanna say that it's one of the most important things we can do to develop a healthy relationship with food is to recognize what our hunger signals are and then honor them. Okay, so that's the nervous and the hormonal systems. We're gonna talk next about digestion. gotten super into pretzels lately. Don't know why. I'm thinking about my dish. Should I have peanut butter, hummus, tzatziki, top tart. Perhaps I'll have all three. Kind of seems good. Tzatziki wasn't open, so I'm going with peanut butter and hummus. Is that, is that weird to have peanut butter and hummus on the same thing? I really don't care. They're both delicious. intense to dip right in the thing. But my house, my rolls, Kyle will be fine. He does the same thing. We're in a corona bubble. He gets it, I'm getting it. Hopefully we won't get it. So, I'm eating these pretzels. My brain is getting the message like, oh good, you're eating. But it had been sending me the message you're hungry, you're hungry. Probably for like the last half hour and I was like, no, I need to finish these videos. So I wasn't paying attention, which means that I was overriding my hypothalamus signals, right? And so the hypothalamus was getting info from my digestive system, like hormonal inputs from my intestine and then also my stomach, as well as just stomach contractions. And then I was starting to feel a little bit like ugh, angry. I, I also couldn't really focus that well, I can be that creative. I was like, no, I've got to power through. So now I'm listening, I'm eating these pretzels with the peanut butter and the hummus. Weird snack, but I love it. And now my cortex will be like, great, you're full. So I've got to listen to my hunger signals, which I'm now doing, and then I'm gonna have to listen to my fullness signals to tell me when to stop eating. So I've got some pretzels out here and we'll see how the snack goes over, I guess. But, um, yeah. snacking one-on-one. -on -one. 